Are you having a tough time getting quality leads on the phone? If so, I think you'll really enjoy this business deep dive with one of our community members who's a registered dietitian who's having issues getting the right people on the phone. So in this deep dive, I'm gonna walk through what her business model looks like, where there are three opportunities to improve what she's doing to ensure she gets better quality leads and better quality prospects on the phone. Without any further ado, let's dive in. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Rena, welcome. How's it going? Are you ready to rock and roll? Give us a little bit of context of who you serve and uh, just really quickly about your business model. Okay, cool. So I am a registered dietitian um, and I've been working as one for the last 18 years, which is a really long time. Um, I'm currently focused on working uh, with, with mostly Jewish women, but I do take on other women who are really struggling to prioritize themselves to make sure that they can kind of make the necessary changes to lose weight. So my goal is kind of on really helping women find a, a lifestyle change and to be able to equip themselves with the, the habits and the the key behavior changes that they're able to live with long term so they can be able to really understand what it means like to be able to, you know, eat all kinds of foods and and do the things that are important for their health, both in the short term and the long term. So I really I, I love working with women and helping them see these changes and helping them move away from that restrictive dieting philosophy. Good. Good. Awesome. So what's the what's the one frustration or problem or constraint that I can help you fix or solve today? The main kind of frustration I find is that like it's it's getting my message out there and and having women realize that they need more support. And I find that is, you know, difficult and it's very difficult to change, which I totally get that. And I myself has gone through many personal changes in the last couple of years and it's your brain and your body like resist those changes. So I get that. But there's often women that I speak to and they're like, yes, I want to lose weight. But then, you know, when it comes down to the changes or investing in themselves, they're like, oh, I'll just, you know, go back to, you know, what has worked for me in the past. And like, I find it frustrating because like it's not serving them well. So like, yes, this is my business and, you know, I do this for a living. But at the same time, it's like having to struggle for so long with like understanding what your body needs and the type of foods that your body needs. And then you lose weight in the short term, but then the weight comes back on like it just it, it it pains me. It like breaks my heart that there's so many women out there who are struggling. And I'd love to be able to get my message across to more people that like there is hope without dieting and that yep. you can live the best life and feel like amazing sure. almost all the time when you're nourishing and fueling your body properly. So Rena, like you don't need to sell me on this. I know this, right? Like I, I'm, I'm on the same page as you are. And like every single health professional watching this or listening to this is in the same boat. Why don't people get this? They should change. They should eat healthier. Here's what I've realized about humans since I've been in this space for 20 years. As much as we want that for them, they don't necessarily see it in the same way that we do, right? And the, the one of the biggest learnings I've had to make was sell people what they want, give them what they need. And how what I'm gathering from your our conversation so far is that it could just be how you're p packaging or positioning what it is you do in the marketplace. And we can kind of dive a little bit deeper into that because it might just be as simple as putting better wrapping paper on what it is you're offering. Because there's two ways to look at this. One is why don't people understand what I'm what I'm saying to them? Why don't they want it? And if we take that perspective of that's my fault. If they can't see the value in this, that's my fault because I'm not doing a good enough job articulating the value. So that's, I think, number one, that's the lesson that I've had to learn very slowly. But I think when we understand that if we have control over our messaging and how we present our stuff, at least we can change it. The second piece to the equation is some people don't actually really want what they say they want. And so that's also a big realization is unless it's a 10 out of 10 for people, they're more comfortable to stay where they are. Because one of the things that I'll just share with you real quick is, let's say this is a graph, okay? So if this is their pain of current situation, mm -hmm. and this is pain of change or perceived pain of change, yeah. no one's saying yes to changing. Right. Right. And this this could be this could be monetarily. This could be I don't want to make the investment. It's too much. Um, I don't want to change what I'm doing. Uh, I don't want to like do the things you're asking me to do. Right. So yes, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to change the way I'm eating. Yes, I want to look better, but I don't want to do anything different. Right. So part of our job in marketing and sales and persuasion is really hammering this home. And this takes time, or in some cases, people are already there where they realize that their current situation is not okay anymore and they have to change. So 
without getting too far, too far ahead, I just want to get a sense of like, what are you currently offering? Like, what is, what is the deliver? Like, is it one-on-one? Is it group coaching? Give me a sense of like what the core offer is and how it's priced. Okay. So my core offer is a 12 week group program, um, specifically for women. Um, and so in the 12 week group program, there's weekly group calls. So that happens kind of on a, in a, on a, I'll resume in a group basis. And then they get three one-to-one calls with me. So we set up the goals initially in the first week, we have a kind of a check-in in week five and a check-in in week 11. There's part of a private Facebook group Group where I often share stuff with them in terms of recipes, content, common questions. They can ask any questions that they want safely and kind of easily in that group. They have unlimited access to me in terms of any other questions they may have. And they, within the 12 week course content, they get kind of weekly content that's drip fed to them in terms of videos and what are the specific tasks for the week. So some of it is nutrition, lifestyle, health based. And then there's often like a little a mindset exercise that I have them work through in terms of really trying to shift beliefs and get them to focus in on what are some of the beliefs that are holding them back. And when they reflect on those, how can we then sort of work with them to be able to create the change that's necessary? So they get that all drip fed to them over the course of the 12 week. The price for that, so if it's paid up kind of all up front, it's 4,000 Canadian. Um, it's a three month program. So if they pay per month, it's 1,500 a month. Uh, 1,500 times. Three. Cool. Um, do you offer a guarantee or anything like that? I do offer in the sense, if they, I do offer a guarantee that I continue to work with them if they're not seeing the results. But obviously there's like, you know, stipulations for that. That means they're showing up to all the calls, they're doing all the work. But because I believe so strongly in this, like if they don't get the results that they want, and I do guarantee 10 to 20 pounds lost in the 12 weeks because I do am very confident that we can get that. But I will continue working with them if they don't lose that, lose even the minimum amount of that weight. Um, and they've gone through all the motions and all the actions that are necessary to to get there. Cool. So if I'm looking at your stuff, I'm, I'm just based on what I'm seeing here. Okay, cool. I promise in working together, we're going to help you lose 10 to 20 pounds or 10 to 12 pounds. 10 to 20. Okay. 10 to 20 pounds in 12 weeks or less. If that doesn't happen, I'll mm-hmm. keep working at you for free until you do or whatever the, you know, the end date is assuming you've met these different criteria, right? Correct. Yeah. Or you've done these different things. Yeah. So w- that's good to know. Thank you for clarifying this. What, so where do you, where's the resistance? Like if you get people on the call, last year, let me, let me do this. Let's go back up here. This, I want to talk about three things. So lead generation, lead nurturing conversions. Okay. So these are three of the five drivers of any business. So what are you doing right now to generate leads? How do people come into your world? And when I say leads, I mean like people opting into your email list. Okay. So the, my main leads are coming in. So what, uh, those are either coming in through Facebook ads. So once they get, once they opt into my lead form on Facebook, and even if they don't, they, that takes them to my application page. So if they go into my lead form, they get added to my email list. Even if they don't, even if they don't fill out the application, they still get all my emails. If someone doesn't come in through Facebook, so either through a referral, I get some referrals from past clients or referrals from some physicians who are like, you know, know of some of the work that I do. So if they get referred to me, then I send them the application link where they fill out the application. They book an assessment call with me, and then they also automatically get added to my email list. So they can kind of come in either way through those. Yeah. So from the lead form, what are they going? What, what's the next page they're landing on? So when they click on the lead form through Facebook, that takes them to my type form application. I have to make sure I kind of know all the flows properly to my type form application, which then has a an image of me and a couple very simple questions somewhere in there. I think they they book the call and then they get a video of me um, talking about what they can expect on the call. So a little bit kind of like, you know, background and thanking them for booking the call and kind of a really appreciative of stepping up to this and taking this first step and making the change. Um, and then they get that video. And after they get that video, so this is when they've already booked an assessment call, they have a sequence of, I don't remember if it's three or five emails that they get in the days leading up to the call, just to kind of, again, prepare them and explain what we'll be talking about on the call. And just so they feel a little bit more comfortable cu- showing up to that call. And I do do that call over Zoom. Cool. Awesome. And what is like, give me, give me some numbers here. Like, so we're like in this process, what is not working? Like if you were to identify, there's probably a number of little things, but what, what would you say is the one thing that is, is really just main bottleneck at the moment? I'd say high quality leads. Okay. So it's like, there are people coming in through Facebook, but they're really not, they're not appropriate and not the type of woman that I, I would be like actively wanting to work with. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. For sure. So what are you paying right now for a lead? from Facebook ads. So I had turned my leads off this past month because of all the Jewish holidays. And I was like, I'm not going to, people I'm targeting aren't on Facebook. So pre- prior to that, my leads were, they were relatively low. Gold $5, five cents, 250. No, like five or $8 a lead. Okay. Let's just call it five. 
And roughly, like how, how long have you run the ads for? What's the total amount of spend been? I've run ads on and off for a while. And I have to say, I've probably spent 8,000, 8, 10,000 on ads. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I have brought in uh, two. So far, I have, I would say like two, two for sure leads from Facebook ads. So I've like made back my revenue. Clients. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. But I've done like a ton of assessment calls, like a ton. Cool. So you're just about broken even on the Facebook ad side of things. Yeah. Um, so on that spend, roughly how many applications slash calls booked have been uh, had from that? So for a while I was getting in a week, like this is something again, like summertime, like before the holidays, yeah. um, I was getting 25 to 30 leads a week. And the conversion, I would say- uh, Sorry, just to clarify, when you say leads, you mean like opt-in and then- No, 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 um, calls book. Okay, so, so 25- No, sorry, 25 to 30 leads coming through. A percentage of those call book, like there was a time I was probably doing, let's say like a third of those were booking calls. So let's say like 10, 10 to 12 calls a week with zero conversions. Oops. And I can look back at my ads managers to confirm, but I feel like that there was a time that it was- and I was limiting my ad spend because of that, because I was like, I feel like I'm spending a ton of money on Facebook ads, but like it's not taking me anywhere. So I was like, I, I had my ad spend at $20 a day split between two ads, $10 each. What was the total number of calls booked over your 10K ad spend roughly? Oh, my 10K ad spend has been over the past almost probably eight months on and off with ads. So total calls booked. I don't know. I'd have to look up at the number and kind of see. I would. If we said 10 per week, that's 40 per month times eight. That's 320 calls booked. Does that sound outrageous? Yeah, I didn't do that many calls for okay. sure not. Because right. Would you say 100 calls or? I'd say maybe like 50 calls. Okay, so 50 calls conducted, right? How many were booked relative to conducted? Oh, more than a couple of no-shows. So I would say maybe like an additional 10, 15 no-shows. So let's say again, and, and this is obviously yeah. the first and most important step here is to track your numbers. Like you got to track these numbers on a weekly basis, like maniacally, because it's really important to identify where the, it's hard to identify where the constraint is without looking at the data. Yeah. So we're kind of just piecing it together here. So if we say seven- I do call- have these numbers in my KPI tracker. I just, um, it's going back quite a, quite a ways back because I haven't had my ad running for the last six weeks. So if I'm looking at this, right, if you're a client of ours and I'm looking at this, Right away, there's like a glaring, glaring opportunity. Do you see what it is? To well, let me let me let me break this down a little bit. So, 50 calls conducted, two clients enrolled. Yeah, so it's that conversion of those calls, um, that multiple calls into the conversions are very low. That's that's like a less than five percent close rate. Right. So that that's an opportunity. And this is something I ask my clients all the time. I'm like, okay, of the 50 people you spoke with, how many were not a fit? Like, you're like, well, how did this person book a call versus how many were a fit, but you kind of let slip through the cracks because you weren't quite sure how to lead the conversation and close the sale. So if you're at a ballpark it, what would you say? Most of them were not a fit. Like 48 of them were not a fit? 40, I would say. Like a good, yeah. So before my closure, before I ran Facebook ads, I did everything organic and I had kind of, it was also when I'm just, just kind of getting started on the private and there was a lot of people I knew or friends of friends or like people that came to me through others. And my conversion rate was close to about 30%. Yeah, so sure. yes, there's room to improve my sales process. But in this situation, I feel like majority of these were not, they were not a fit. Plus yeah. they were like, I think such a, such a cold lead that they just weren't, weren't ready to kind of make that huge jump into, into coming yeah. on board. So just to simplify this model so everyone understands like what we're talking about here. So you've got, you've got ad. So this is going to be old traffic. Yeah. And then they're going to essentially application to a call, right? Yeah. So this, I mean, this play, you'll get a high volume of calls, which you've already kind of experienced to some degree. Yeah. The challenge though, is that the quality is not there. Correct. So with what, obviously what we do, and I'm sure you may be aware of this or not, like the one thing, the difference of what we work with our clients on and how our business operates is that I will never speak to anyone unless they've watched my webinar first. And the reason for that is because we want people coming in pre-qualified, pre-sold and warmed up before they have a chance to even book a call. Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit of a video after they book a call to just kind of prep them and so forth. And again, like it depends who you speak to. People have different philosophies on how, you know, how they want to build their business. But the reason that we do what we do is because I've pretty much done 
everything. And I've realized that most of our clients like you are amazing health professionals. They're busy. They don't have all day to just talk to anyone. They want to talk to the right people. And so because of that, we have to, if we want committed clients, we have to make our marketing more requirement of commitment in the process, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple things. I want to talk about this first. There's three things I see. So one, I think there's an opportunity to inject some type of online presentation that gives someone an understanding of how you view the problem that they're here to solve mm -hmm. and then how your philosophy of solving that is unique, different, better than stuff they've seen before. Some people will say, I don't have time to watch this. Cool. See you later. Right? Like they're not serious, yeah. but enjoy that Netflix movie tonight. Right? So like, don't worry about people who say they don't, they don't have time because it's, we have time for stuff that's a must for us. So typically when you have people watch any amount of your content, the more time on brand, the better it is for you, right? The more people pay attention, the more likely they are to pay. The less people know you, the less they trust you, the less they're going to show up, the less they're going to be, you know, primed and qualified. And so this is a, an easy first kind of addition to this, to this funnel. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense as a starting yeah. point? Yeah. And around how long would that webinar be? It doesn't matter. I mean, we've had webinars that were three hours that did really well. Now I'm not saying three hours, but typically, you know, 30 to 60 minutes is more than enough. Okay. And again, like it's, it's not about how long it is. It's more about just what's required to get the message across. And in my mind, there's not a big difference between 30 and 50 or 60 minutes. If someone, if this is a major pain point for someone, they will watch it. Yeah. And a lot of like the biggest pushback I get from people is like, well, people are busy these days. They don't have time to watch webinars. I'm like, I know, I know, but they will if it's something they really need to solve. Yeah. And that's what we're, that's the difference here. I'm not saying there isn't a place for ad app call. In your current funnel, you could certainly test that to your warm email list, right? Who've been receiving stuff from you for a long time. And so now it's not necessarily ad, but it's email application call. But for people who don't yet even know who you are, what you do, how your approach is different, um, it's really important to have that webinar in place because do you ever find yourself speaking with people who are like, what exactly do you do? Uh, very rarely. Like, okay. yeah, no, not that often. Okay. But they'll say, I don't know anything about your program. But like, do you have any questions? Or like, I don't know anything about your program. Can you tell me a bit about what you offer? Yeah, exactly. So there's, 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 you want people to jump on a call with you and be like, man, I've seen a bunch of your stuff. I, like, I think you're the right fit for me. Like, without even going any further, like they're already... Yeah. Instead of them being like, who are you? What is this all about? How does your program work? Like you'll get into that stuff, but you want people to come in with some degree of priming, which definitely helps the conversion on the call. Right. However, the bigger issue for me is right here. I would strongly, very strongly advise against using Facebook lead ads because you get what you pay for. And mm -hmm. every single time we have tested running lead ads, we get shit quality. And Facebook is, the problem with Facebook is that it is so good at giving you exactly what you want. I'll give you an example. So again, if we look at lead ads, just for everyone watching this, lead ads, person clicks the button or the link and it pops up on Facebook. They're not leading the platform to like an opt-in page. So right. the idea there is that you can get more leads at a lower cost for this or for the same ad spend. So initially we're like, oh, that's great. It's not. And it, in my experience, and I think obviously you're kind of recognizing this too, yeah. it's, it's the quality is, it's not there. The other thing too is your, what you're paying for a lead is what most of our clients pay for, for a normal lead off of Facebook. So if your Facebook lead ads were crushing, they would be no, like under $2 a lead typically in mm -hmm. your space. You're already paying a premium for shitty quality leads. So it's kind of yeah. like a double, you know, a double whammy and not the right direction. So um, as an example, because Facebook's algorithm is so good, if you optimize for leads from a lead form, Facebook will give you, Facebook will put your stuff in front of people who are more likely to opt in to something on Facebook. If you take it one step removed from that to say, hey, I'm looking for leads, like websites and tribes off of Facebook, they'll give you people like that. If you're optimizing for calls booked, you'll get a better quality of person. If you optimize for clients enrolled, you'll get a better quality of person. So we want to move closer to the ultimate point of purchase as much as possible. But as a starting point, I think a really important thing would be looking at just swapping out lead ads to a normal ad that goes to an opt-in page and then tracking that lead conversion in that fashion. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I've never done this. I'm not sure what that is. That's like, it's still a Facebook ad. Like it's still running on Facebook, but it doesn't, 
what do they click on when they see the ad? They click on a link, but instead of it being inside of Facebook, they just they go to your website's opt-in page. Uh, and that's it. Okay. Uh, okay. So you'll have potentially a lower volume of leads for the same amount of ad spend, potentially, but they will generally be better. Mm. The other thing too to always remember, and this is something I, I, I talk about all the time, is that it is always a messaging issue. Always. Mm. You have a good offer. Like, I mean, you have an offer that is very strong. You have a guarantee. You've got a good promise. The price is, for people that are like, it's too expensive or like, it's not. Like, it's ridiculous. They just don't want it badly enough or they don't see the value, whatever it is. So you have a really, really solid offer and it's very clear. It's compelling. It's tangible. It's great. So the offer is good. And the, I don't know what exactly what the messaging looks like because I haven't seen your copy, et cetera. But we always want to be looking at how do we, you know, when you have, how many different ad copies have you run over time? The copy, I've actually not changed that often. I've, I tested a whole bunch, like maybe like five or six, and I've been changing the creatives more yeah. than the copy. Yeah. So that's a big opportunity. Like if you've done five or six, do 50 or 60. Really? Yeah. It's it's like, the thing is, whether we're posting on social media, sending out emails, you know, creating videos on YouTube, running ads, the likelihood that with a very small volume, we're going to hit a home run is pretty low. Yeah. And that's why it's really important to test new angles, longer copy versus shorter copy. It's good that you're playing with the creatives. That's good. Um, but it's the biggest opportunity because if you have a lead quality problem as it shows up on a call, yeah. where do those people initially come from, right? They come from the invitation you put out on the internet or on Facebook, Instagram. So it's important to change the invitation in terms of the messaging if we want to appeal to a different person, right? Or a okay. different level of commitments, even within the same demographic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so, what you find is more important, the creative that catches their attention or the copy or both? It's it's very hard to say one or the other. The creative, because it takes up so much more real estate, 70% of the stop, like stopping the scroll will be the creative, like having an right. image that captures your attention or a video, whatever it is. But we don't just want to stop people in their tracks. We want to make sure they keep reading and click the link to go to the next step. So that's where, um, are your ads typically shorter? Are they longer? A copy? Yeah. That's not, it's like, if it's not super long. Like it's kind of in between, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Like I have some bullet points and I have so, like, it's, I don't know, a couple, it's like, it takes up you know, like this much space on the, on the page. So if you have a lower, if you've got a lower quality of person coming through, we want to look at the messaging. So in terms of like the actual languaging. Yeah. Second thing we could look at is making the ad a little bit longer. Okay. Because it, number one, it repels people who don't want to take a second to read it. So it's right. a commitment play. Right. And the more they read, again, very much like watching a webinar, the more committed they are to the process. Now, right. you, like if you had a one sentence and link, you'll get more clicks. You'll get all that stuff. But you'll get a lower conversion rate, a lower quality of lead versus what we call a long ass copy, which is more story based, more connection based. So people even on Facebook are connecting with you and your story and how you can help them. Mm. So the messaging is massively important, uh, but initially 70% of the performance of an ad a lot of times will come down to the creative because mm -hmm. getting someone to stop in their tracks is really important, but then also the copy has to do its work. Right. So if you're looking at your metrics on Facebook and you have a lower, if you have a less than 1.5% link click-through rate, that's usually an indication that the copy is not compelling for people to want to even click on the next step. Okay. So yeah, so the lead ads just moving into a normal, uh, it's based on how Facebook is set up now, the objective will be sales. And then you'll just qualify in Facebook what a sale is. It's essentially a lead or a website subscribe on your website. Okay. So yeah. Webinar, I think is the next step, but usually like we want to take one step at a time. Like it, I think is if you kept everything the same, the easiest place to start is just changing up how you're running the ads because right. I think with the same process, you can see if there's a different caliber of person coming through. If you're still dealing with some of that stuff, you could keep tweaking the ad copy and do that. Or you could say, let's add one barrier of, or one little friction point, which is the webinar and see if that makes a difference. Right. So that would be kind of the second step. Okay. Um, and then the third thing really is just, it's really the, the selling skills. I mean, it's the number one leverage point for, you know, any business. And it's really important to remember, like we talked with people like, yeah, my conversion rates 80% or my close rates 80%. I'm like, cool. Friends and family aside, right? Like, well, what is it? You know, yeah. it's like, well, you know, it's like, well, cool. Like if someone walks into your clinic, they're in, right? Like if someone yeah. is your family or referred from a family member or friend, they're in. 
more likely. But if someone doesn't know who you are, it's really, really important to build the skill of being able to talk to a stranger, building rapport, building trust, so that in one or two calls, they're able to say like, here you go, let's do this. Yeah. And so the, the third opportunity I see here is obviously improving those selling skills and and knowing how to conduct that conversation. Yeah. Um, because it's such a huge, huge leverage point in any type of business like this, where it's you enrolling a client, working with them at a higher level. Um, that's that's a massive, massive leverage point. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. And that's the other thing I'm kind of like struggling with a bit too, is not so much in the sales, but I really like, I feel like I'm like an unknown. Like I really want to kind of work on sort of like creating this, whether it's a brand or a legacy or something that I kind of get myself out there in in terms of like being an expert in the field and really kind of having people sort of come towards me because of that. And that's kind of, I don't really know how to do that, like to kind of like, you know, other than than marketing and kind of putting myself out there, but getting sort of in front of people more frequently so that they become aware of who I am and what I have to offer. Yeah, totally. I mean, you can, there's two ways of doing that. I mean, there's definitely benefits to building your following. There's a huge benefit to building a brand that people recognize. I mean, The Rock yeah. was unknown. The Rock now has what, like close to 400 million uh, followers on Instagram. And he has a tequila business that's worth a billion dollars. Yeah. So is his tequila business worth a billion dollars? If he was The Rock from 25 years ago, who was living in $7 in his pocket and no one knew him? No, not at all. Yeah. So Having a huge or having a following of people who know, like, and trust you is a huge asset, but it takes a very, very long time. So there's two ways of doing it, right? And I think you have to look at where you are in your business journey to say, okay, what makes the most sense? Because when you're early on, and for most people watching this, like under 5K a month in revenue, unless you're willing to invest in advertising, the only thing you can do is your manual effort, which means posting right. content over and over again, playing that game, which has its place and there can be tremendous value to that. But you get to a point where, you know, depending on your on your, your life, your schedule, et cetera, where you need more leverage. And that's where advertising mm -hmm. comes in. The nice thing about advertising is like, you don't even have to have an Instagram account. So you don't even have to have social media on your phone. And at the push of a button, your ads will be shown to more people anyways. Right. So advertising, whether it's an ad or a post, it's it's about you being seen by people, getting in front of them. Number one, if no one knows who you are, well, they're not going to work with you, right? That's, right. that's obvious. Two, the more people see you, the more they're going to trust you, which is actually really interesting. There's a huge amount of uh, psychology and cognitive biases that we have. And one of the things like when we see something over and over again, we attribute more value to that thing. Like we, there's inherently more trust. Like if we saw, if we see McDonald's signs all over the place for our whole life, we just trust that brand more than some random yeah. burger joint that just started up. Yeah. That's why building a brand takes a very long time. And that's why being in front of your audience is not as easy as we'd like it to be because either you have to pump out a lot of content that gets eyeballs or, and, or you have to use advertising that does that with a lot more leverage. And so it depends on, you know, the game you want to play and both have their place and both are extremely valuable, but the posting game organic just takes a lot longer. It would be like uh, driving from Toronto to Los Angeles, whereas paid traffic is like flying. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so it's just, it's, you know, and I, and I think like a lot of our clients come to us and they're in a very similar situation, right? They, they have this expertise. They know they can transform lives. They don't necessarily want to play all day on social because they're super busy as it is. And it's like, cool, like we're going to use this perfect client pipeline, run ads, et cetera. And most of them don't have a following. They build very successful businesses. And then they get to a point where they're, you know, in the low to mid six figures with like, cool, I have a bit more bandwidth. I have a bit more capital. Now I want to start looking at going back and actually building the social media following, building the brand, because you can do both and amplify both, right? Oh. So my suggestion is you do one thing really well. You have one core offer, which is what you do, which is perfect. So you've got a really good starting point because most people don't even have that. So you're in a good place to start. Second thing is you focus on mastering one channel, which means in your case, maybe it's Facebook ads. Third is one target market, which you already have, mm -hmm. up until a million dollars. And you just focus, we just do that. Because you will get there eventually. The only you know, the only question is, well, how fast, how long is it gonna take? What's the investment gonna look like on the advertising front, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but the danger is when a lot of relatively young entrepreneurs, when I say young, I mean, in terms of years in business, is they start doing everything. Yeah. Right. They're doing TikTok, Instagram, dabbling in Facebook ads. Uh, they've got a podcast, a YouTube channel, and nothing is really moving the needle because they're just spread too thin. Yeah. 
sense. Yeah. So yeah. So my recommendation, as I mentioned, is on the ad front, I would move away from lead ads. I would consider okay. testing a webinar on that funnel and then developing your selling skills. Those are the three okay. things that will make the biggest difference in, um, in what you're currently doing. That help? Okay. Very, very helpful. I'm going to start with the Facebook ads and just kind of change my system in terms of those and see see where I get. Perfect. Yeah. Was this helpful? Very helpful. Awesome. Amazing. Thanks Thank so you. much for hanging out today. My pleasure. Thanks for all your help. Yeah. So nice to meet you. You too. Bye. Have you ever had anyone say to you, I need to think about it. It's too expensive. I need to run this by my wife. Let me get some stuff in order before I move forward. And I'm just not sure this is going to work. If you've had any of those objections come up on any of your sales calls, this video is for you.